Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A father of five children won a toy at a raffle. When he got home, he called his, his, his kids together and he asked them uh, that, about, uh, about this new gift that he found, this, this new thing here for them. And he said to them, Who of you is the most obedient, he asks. Who never talks back to mother or stresses her out? Who does everything she says with no jibber-jabber? After a long pause, five small voices answered in unison, Okay, Dad, you get the toy. (laughs) So happy Father's Day to all of our obedient dads out there. You indeed are the king of your castle, the head of your house, and your wife told me it was okay to say that. So just like in our Mother's Day message from uh, back in May, we hear again St. Paul's words for parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So there you go. Honor, respect, Love. That is what we owe to our fathers. And that's what the Lord teaches us in his word. This is the message that we proclaim to an unbelieving world. And the unbelieving world is a world that is getting worse and worse by the day. Anything that is anti-Christian, anti-church, anti-family is promoted and endorsed. Lies and corruption exist all around us. We find that people are turning from the faith of their fathers back into paganism and secularism and hedonism all the time. So what the world needs right now more than ever is fathers, Christian fathers who will teach their children the Christian faith and right from wrong in accordance with God's word. We need a few good men, a few good men like Abraham who believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. Father's Day wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about Father Abraham He's truly the guy, the man of faith. He started out life wanting to be a dad, but had no children. There was no heir, no family tree, no dynasty. And yet from that downtrodden, childless circumstance, God Almighty made to him a promise. Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. The promise of everything Abraham ever wanted was made. He could have been skeptical, he could have turned away from God's word, but instead he believes it. He's faithful to God's promise. And here we are today, the children of that promise, descendants of faith, numerous as all the stars of heaven. One of my pastoral theology classes that we had back in seminary was to do an inner city immersion trip, and in this case we went to Cowtown, to Calgary. And on this trip, we encountered many different inner city experiences that inner city pastors might run into. We went to a mosque, to a Hindu temple. We talked to a Buddhist lady. We visited a Messianic Jewish synagogue. And we talked with several different church groups. And one guy was an Alliance Church pastor, and he was starting a brand new church in Calgary. And they researched it. And his research led him to believe that if they were able to get the dad of a family involved in the church, then you got the whole family. So they started a church completely geared toward ministering to men. So this kind of shows us how important fathers are to the growth and the life of the church. They set the tone. And if they are faithful, like Abraham, great things happen. Countless Bible verses preach the role of the Christian dad. Our Old Testament reading from Proverbs keys into it. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you are awake, they will talk with you. When the, for the commandments it is a light and the teaching a light. And the reproofs of a discipline of the way of life. So this passage is about keeping our faith as the number one spot in life, bound to your heart, worn like a necklace, when you walk, when you lie down, when you're awake. This is a paraphrase from Deuteronomy 6, famous passage that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, 
with all of your soul and all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So the question is, how, how often do we talk with our kids about faith? On average, I think people today talk to their kids about 30 minutes of the day. So of that 30 minutes, how many of those minutes are we talking about Jesus? Salvation, forgiveness, baptism, right and wrong. And yet, God's word tells us we should do this. We should be diligently teaching our kids God's word when we sit down, when we walk, when we lie down, when we get up in our hands and between our eyes, even on doorposts and gates, the scriptures say. The gospel of Christ and his commandments, they should be as heir to us, especially Christian fathers. And then we say, oh boy, have we ever failed on this one. It's amazing how fast this has changed in our world. We've gone largely from a society where everybody went to church or had basic morality in common to a society that is totally fragmented, shares nothing in common, and embraces immorality at every single turn. Well, the same thing happened you know, over time when you look through the scriptures. If you think about Joshua, this is exactly what happened. If you remember him, he fought the battle of the Jericho. The walls came tumbling down. And even though God did mighty things through Joshua and allowed him and his people to have huge victories, as soon as Joshua was gone, the scriptures say this. The people abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after false gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them. They bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. And so the Lord stopped the victories. He allowed his people to be plundered, and they were in terrible distress. So the bottom line here is that when fathers fail to be the Christian leaders that God has made them to be, when they fail to teach the Lord's ways and his commandments to their children from the scriptures and by example, when they shirk their fatherly duties, the results are catastrophic. And we're seeing many of those results right now in this lawless and ever more pagan society. It's as if all discipline has been thrown out the window in our world. And this is the crux of the issue. You can't have a disciple without discipline. Our Hebrews reading touches on this exactly as well. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which we have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we that much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later on, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. As our Lord God shows to us his discipline, we see the purpose. And the purpose is this, to yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And that's truly what's lacking in our utter clown world that we live in right now. Yet our God is still the God of grace and mercy. He's still our Heavenly Father, and He knows us. He knows our sins, He knows our failings, He knows our struggles, and He promises His divine help, His strength, His forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord, His only Son. It is in the cross where we are shown forgiveness for our failings. His resurrection from the grave shows us the power that our Lord has the power to help us in our struggles. The Holy Spirit promises to be the helper of fathers and mothers in the task that God has given them. A little boy at the Lutheran church down by the pump was caught swearing like a trucker in church in the potluck lineup of all places. <laughs> Young man, where did you learn to talk that way? said the boy, shocked and embarrassed mother. The little boy looked over at his father and said, well, Dad, should I tell her? <laughs> Dad sets the tone. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's faithful. Other times, not so much. But we have no perfect fathers except for our Heavenly Father. 
But like Abraham, we can look to his word in faith. We can believe the Lord, and it is credited to us as righteousness. Despite our fatherly failings or those of our fathers, God's word and promise still remains. Honor your father, that it will go well for you. Love and respect him. As a father, it's great to know that our heavenly father is gracious. That he's always with us, just like he was with Abraham and Joshua. That he gives us the strength that we need for every day of our lives. That his word fills us with hope and with help to be and to do this vocation of fatherhood. Certainly, we have made and we will make mistakes. Yet the grace of God continues to help us in our shortfalls. As we trust our Lord, as we trust his word to us, and to all fathers everywhere. Thanks and praise be to God, our Heavenly Father, and happy Father's Day. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all of our human understanding, may it guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and to life everlasting. Amen.